welcome to Creative Piecemeal Podcast, a podcast for creatives. I'm your host, Tammy Takeishi. Join me for compelling conversations with artists, actors, authors, musicians, and other creatives about the impact of the creative and fine arts in their lives and our ever-changing world. Thank you for listening. Welcome to Creative Piecemeal Podcast. I am your host, Tammy Takeishi, and today's guest is author and scientist Andrea Kud Alamani. She is the founder of Patient Navigation Team LLC, a private professional patient advocacy business, and the author of the children's book, Ava Antibody Explains Your Body and Vaccines, published in the summer of 2020. This book is a true inside look at how vaccinations elicit an immune response. It was recently highlighted by CHOP, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, as a book on their shelf in their newsletter generated by Dr. Paul Offit, renowned immunologist and director of the Vaccine Education Center. When not engaging in scientific research, Mrs. Alamani enjoys volunteering, supports arts education, and spending time with her family. Her book, Ava Antibody Explains Your Body and Vaccines, is available from Barnes & Noble and other fine retailers. It can also be purchased directly from her website, avaantibody.com, with a dollar donation going to End Polio Now, and there are options for personalization. If you purchase from her website, shipping is free. She also supports independent bookstores, so go to your favorite one and request her book there. Welcome, Miss Alamani. Thank you so much, Tammy. I'm happy to be here. Happy to have you. Your book is absolutely adorable and very timely given the current situation right now. Can you tell us a little more about it and what you would like to see happen with with it in 2021? Well, I can tell you that this book um, sat in a folder for maybe five to six years before I took it out. And prior to that, it was originally written about 20 years ago when my children were actually going and getting their vaccines from the pediatrician. I always realized that there needed to be an explanation to the parent about the purpose of vaccines and you just didn't get one in that um, that brief interaction you had with your physician. So um, you walk out with a screaming kid and not a lot of information. So I wanted to change that and my passion has been kind of boiling under the surface ever since my kids were little two decades ago. Last August, I started drafting this book in in seriousness, and I took the the illustrations my mother had drafted for me two decades ago and started building out a real book that could be published, and I contracted with Wisdom House Books here in North Carolina, and so um, I began the journey. So that's that's how it began, Um, and you asked me what I'd like to see in 2021 for my book. Well, Honestly, I would like to see every family have a copy of this book. It is um, a great, accurate presentation of a B-cell immune response. It touches on the topics of virus neutralization, uh, which is something we're hearing a lot about in the news right now. It also touches on herd immunity. So it really does, um, it really does help people understand the basics of the immune system and what happens in your body when you have a vaccine. Whether it's a flu shot or a seasonal allergy shot, I think kids don't always know what's going on and it just looks like a scary needle. And I think it's fantastic that you explain not only the science behind it, but also just the experience as a whole and different scenarios like with Charlie Chicken Pox and you know what happens and I think it's very accessible and definitely something that is useful if, like in pediatricians offices across the nation. Do you have any plans to follow that up with any other books? Um, yes I do but I did want to just um, go back for a second. You mentioned the illustrations and they are wonderful and that was an interesting journey as well. Uh, I do have a professional illustrator. His name is Roman Diaz, and he actually lives in Mexico. So I've never met him. I've never had a Zoom meeting with him. We did all of this through our respective representatives. 
And so um, I'm so lucky that I got to pick him out of hundreds of different options. And he just did a fabulous job with the concepts that I gave him. So speaking about other books, I've actually already started one. I've had some children give me some input and they want to know what happens when you fall and skin your knee or scrape your arm and you start bleeding, how your body stops and um, what that looks like from the inside. So I already have um, the names of ruby red blood cell and periplatelet. Um, so I'm already working on that. And uh, it'll be just like this book where you're actually inside and you're taking that voyage through the body and you're seeing how your body is able to stop the bleeding from happening. So sounds like you're going to have another, another wonderful hit on your hands with books. So you majored in chemistry and went on to devote your life to science and medicine. And I was wondering what inspired you to enter the sciences and what continues to inspire you to this day? Well, I don't really know. I know that when I was a kid, I would do things like mix baby powder and conditioner and shampoo and make a big mess in the bathroom. And it, was, it would change colors. And so I loved that. Uh, of course, my mom did not like the cleanup duty on that stuff. But um, I've just always kind of gravitated toward that. I've always been amazed by the miracle of life, whether it's a tree or a bug or a, a snake even, um, but certainly mammals, you know, and horses and things. And so I've always been pulled that direction. So um, when I went to Appalachian, I started off actually as a biology major. And then I changed to chemistry because I wasn't sure whether I would be whether I would be able to or want to go on to grad school. So I went with I went with chemistry, and it's turned out to serve me very well. Um, I've had a great career contracting with agricultural company here in Greensboro, North Carolina, and it's given me the opportunity to also branch out and do patient advocacy work. So um, and then of course write this book. So it's been wonderful for me. It sounds like you're definitely keeping busy. Can you tell me a little bit more about your patient advocacy business? That business also was inspired from some things that happened in my life. Um, my dad had lymphoma when my children were young. This was back during the same time we were drafting that original Ava Antibody book. He had lymphoma and then it recurred two years later and he ended up with a stem cell transplant at Duke University. Um, he is still alive and well with us today, but that journey really did show me how researching and helping people understand their diagnoses, their medications, what their doctor's saying to them, and being kind of that scientific liaison between just the average person and the, and the technical doctor or scientist, there really is so much value there, and you really do help people feel that they are part of their own healthcare decisions, and they really can engage with their doctor and have more confidence in their conversation. And when you see that click and you're in the room with that, it is an amazing experience to, to be part of. So I just, I love that. It sounds like very rewarding work, you know, definitely helping people make sense of what's happening to them and the medical jargon and making it more accessible and, you know, less of a scary or even intimidating process. That's really the goal is to empower people to feel like they're confident medical consumers. And I do that by, I read those little inserts that come with the, the medications. And um, of course I print them on, you know, I've got old eyes, so I print it on bigger paper, but I do read that stuff. And I take that information and help and help people understand their medications, potential side effects, better questions to ask their doctor. And I just put it all on a table for them so they can take it right to their doctor. They can ask questions or I can go with them. Um, just it's a very personalized experience. And so it's really gratifying to see that the doctor and the patient engage and they both get each other and you've been a part of that. So it's very exciting. But I'm sure it's not without its challenges. Um, is there anything that comes to mind that's happened to you? It almost seemed like it would be the barrier that a lot of people in your business have to overcome. A lot of barriers. And um, 
And one of them is actually getting the word out about what you're doing for, for the patient advocacy work. There are less than a thousand independent patient advocates in the United States. And um, that was at last count. Hopefully there's, hopefully it's doubled or tripled by now. But the point is, is that when you don't have that ability of, you know, that knowledge, that prior knowledge, you really have to educate the person about what you're able to do, as well as market yourself all in one little elevator speech. And it's, it's quite the challenge. Um, and when I first got into this, I thought, oh, people are going to love this and they are going to, you know, come at me in droves. And um, they have not. And I think it's because they really don't understand what your role is. Um, you don't, uh, you generally, um, health insurance does not cover an independent patient advocate. They don't know what to do with it either. Um, sometimes I go in and talk to a doctor and they think I'm an attorney. <laughs> so, um, so there's just a lot of, you know, a lot of education that has to happen and it's, it's a great opportunity, but it is also, it can also be a stumbling block to your mission the mission of your job that you're trying to do for that person. So what's one of the best compliments or rewarding things that's happened to you in your, in your job? I've had many of them. I think the standout uh, experience that I had initially as a patient advocate was a newborn baby that had a fungal infection on their feet and the doctors were unable to determine the cause of that. And they were uh, the child of a military person. So they were going back and forth between uh, very well-respected um, medical facilities, but they were going back and forth. And so as a part of this process, the grandmother became um, very, you know, very concerned. And she just said, I can't do this. She said, can you please look at everything here? And so I did, I looked at all the records and I said, oh my goodness. I said, I think I think they've done, they had done so much testing. And I said, I just, has there been an ultrasound done anywhere of this little baby? And, a, and there had not been. So did an ultrasound and they found that there was this little place at this child's belly button where there was an invagination and a little bit of amniotic fluid had gotten in there and his body was responding to that as an immune response, as a foreign protein in his body. And it was not fighting the fungus on his feet. And the reason why this is so important is because he was being diagnosed through the process of elimination with probably having um, leukocyte adhesion disorder, which is about the same as having active, an active AIDS case where you have, if you have white blood cells, you have an immune system, but your, your white blood cells cannot be transported along the walls of your arteries and veins to get to the source of the infection. So um, that's basically a case where those children generally don't live past 10 years of age. So I was so happy to be a part of finding, finding that there was, there was something else much more simple going on there. Um, and that family that's been 10 years and they, they still, they still thank me for that. So that is one of the, that like you live for that when you're doing this kind of work. And I'm sure, I'm sure with your music therapy, you can identify when, when you've just, when you've made an impact that you were just in the right place at the right time and you made that impact. So that's one of the examples. Um, more, more recently, just last week, I was at a, um, Actually, it was a Rotary International meeting. I was on Zoom and I read Ava Antibody Explains to the group. And I went back and explained um, some of the pictures from a more scientific standpoint, a more adult approach to, to what's happening there. And um, I got an email back from, from someone that, that was part of that presentation. And they said that my ambition to help people understand what's happening now and just the purpose of vaccines in as a whole had really um, helped that person to become inspired to do more volunteering and more reaching out in the new year. And so that is, that's a big compliment to me. That's wonderful. On both accounts, you know, not only with that baby, you know, giving relief to the family, having answers, you know, I think a lot of times the anxiety and the fear in a hospital setting, whether it's from the adults or the children is simply not knowing and then from there is 
you know, the, the fear that comes with that. And then, and of course, having the knowledge of knowing like, oh, this is why this is happening. This is the reaction, you know, that's, that's very powerful and, and all because of, of something so simple. And both the book and the patient advocacy work are, are very powerful. And that is because it puts people in a position to feel that they can ask better questions. You don't have to ask the perfect question. I know it feels that way when you're talking to someone who's got 10 times more education than you do, but you don't have to ask the perfect question. You just have to ask a question and engage with them. And so a little bit of information, a little bit of, you know, losing some of the intimidation can go a long way to helping you. I had one case where um, this, this individual had me come. I drove two hours to attend a doctor's appointment with this individual because they were petrified of having a discussion with their doctor. And I said, I'll ask the tough questions. I don't mind. I can walk out and they'll never see me again, or maybe they will, but I'll, I'll handle it for you. So I was all prepared. It turned out I did not have to say a word. I shook the doctor's hand. I sat down and that was it. And later when we were leaving that, that client said to me, they said, just the fact that you were in the room and I knew I had a safety net, I was able to handle it. And I said, oh yes, you absolutely were. So, so we all need that safety net. And, and generally we need a little bit of knowledge. Um, so, so I encourage my clients and readers of Ava Antibody to um, look at the resources, the National Institutes of Health, the Centers for Disease Control. You can go out on these websites. They have PDFs you can print. They're very, very simple explanations of a lot of things, where you're, whether you're looking for vaccines or anything else, any sort of um, even vitamin supplements and those kinds of things. You can get tons of information and a vast majority of it is something that can really remove some fear and give you some basic knowledge and, and no longer feel as intimidated by the topic. The ultimate goal is that everyone becomes their own advocate, ideally. I think so. I, and I think um, we can all do that. But, but the reason why a patient advocate is so important is because when you start talking about your own health or the health of a loved one, you really have a hard time digesting information, whether it's good news or bad news, it's sometimes hard to take in. And, and so it's, it's hard. I've seen people be their own advocate where they have um, terminal cancer. I know of one example, and I was amazed that this person was able to stand her ground with her doctors and go through all of these scenarios by herself, talking about her own body. I, I don't know that I would have the strength to do that. And I, I think a lot of us probably don't. So, so sometimes I think we do need, we do need that person that cares, but is far enough away from the situation that they can see what's going on and, and have a little bit more objective approach to helping you. Right. Especially when it comes to our health, you know, there's a lot of emotions attached, whether it's good news or bad news and having that that third party mediator there for support to help, you know, explain things, to help clarify, to be like a, a backbone essentially can, can be so important. But, but what I try to do after, um, after a telephone call with a doctor or, or an appointment, if we're in person, I'd really do try to take a moment and just say to them, did I stay in my lane with you? Because they are still, the, I am not a medical professional. I am not a medical expert. I am just there to help as more of a scientific liaison between the two parties. So I always wanna make sure that I am respectful of the medical professional, whether it's a doctor or a nurse and always you know, get feedback from them. I, I try to get feedback in real time as, as we're, discussing things, I try to be very careful with that, but I do also try to make sure that I take a moment and, and ask them how I did, because that is so important to, you know, we do want to maintain that respect for our medical professionals. Of course. And that's fantastic that you're so self-aware and wanting to learn and improve in that manner in your profession, because it just makes you even better advocate and an even better ally 
for both the patient and the and the health professional. I hope so. I hope so. That is my goal. I want to be respected by both and feel like that they both understand each other and I've made that better for both parties. That's that's the goal. So So you've been, you know, doing your own business and of course, you know, you've writing books for a little while. Uh, how did your family and friends react? Did they say, oh, I always knew she was going to do X, Y, Z and, or, or did, or did it come out of the blue? Like, oh, she's, she's writing books now, you know? Uh, the book kind of came out of the blue because like I said, it just sat in a folder for a couple of decades. And, and I, as I started doing the patient advocacy work and I actually formed an LLC in 2016, but I had been doing patient advocacy work for two decades prior as a volunteer. Um, no, actually in terms of the patient advocacy work, everyone was like, this is a natural progression for you because you just love doing it. And fortunately I, I'm good at it. And, and as I said, um, both the patient and the doctor or healthcare professional generally like me and they will, they both get something out of it. They're both better for the experience that we have. So, um, I love that. That energizes me. Um, so I don't think anyone was so surprised that I went off and did that. But the book, I think it was surprising because like I said, it just sat there in a folder and I took it out and I said, oh, I think I might do this. And this was after I had been involved with patient navigation team for a while and running that business. But I decided that the Ava Antibody Explains Your Body and Vaccines book is a perfect, is a perfect embodiment of advocacy because it really does try to take very complicated concepts of immunology and make them something that's understandable for a little kid. It's pretty much the same thing. It's just in paper. But I will tell you that writing the book is, it's not for the, the, the week of heart. It is a, it is, it is definitely um, an undertaking. And so there's a lot, I could write a book on writing a book. <laughs> So, but it's really both, they're really both advocacy. So I think, I think that's so important just in a, you know, the book is really written. I would say, Tammy, um, my, uh, my initial goal was kids right around that five-year age where they're getting all those shots so they can understand at least it's, it's worth getting stuck in the leg so they don't have to be out of school and, you know, in bed for a week with something. So it, it does make it worth it to them. I, I actually have one friend whose granddaughter took my book into her pediatrician and explained to him, he, she said, see, I understand why you have to give me this shot. Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> Is that not cool? I just love that. This book was just as important two years ago as it is today, as it is going to be five years from now. So it's just, it's just a timing thing. The fact that Charlie Chicken Pops looks a little bit like the coronavirus, that's a complete coincidence. Roman Diaz had already drawn him and finalized Charlie Chicken Pox, I assure you. <laughs> what resources have helped you along the way? Like, are there any any specific books that you read that inspired you to get you to where you are or any role models who you really look up to who helped you? Actually, I, I have a lot of role models from a lot of different places and some of them are actually in my volunteer organizations. As you can tell, I'm wearing an in polio now hat. I am in Rotary International here in Greensboro area. I'm actually in a club called the E-Club of Global Trekkers. So we have members from all over the world. We've been meeting in Zoom meeting uh, long before this year. There's a lot of inspiration happening there. One of them's a medical doctor. One of them has written a book. And so anytime you're around a group of people with that much positive energy, it just, it's contagious. And so that's been really nice. I have, I have plenty of role models uh, that are scientists. My research advisor at Appalachian State University is now the head of the chemistry department at Appalachian. So um, she's quite the role model because obviously she's a woman in a, in a leading capacity in a, in a technology field. So in a university setting, she's definitely a role model for me. In terms of references, I, again, I would go back and say to you that the National Institutes of Health and the Centers for Disease Control really do have a lot of information and you can get as technical 
or you know as as simple as you want there so those are the places i go to because because of that there are also a couple of other references in the book that are um, there's a netflix video explaining um i think it's called viruses explained i'll have to check that <laughs> i didn't commit it to memory but um also dr paul offit at the vaccine education center at children's hospital of philadelphia he has some fantastic videos um, and he talks about all kinds of aspects of vaccines and immunology. And also those are in a very, um, very easy to understand format. That sounds excellent. Um, we're gonna switch gears. And what is the last book you read for fun? Other than Ava Antibody, I have to give her another plug because I've read her a few times. The other one, and I'll just have to tell you, Tammy, I'm a, I'm a big cheat when it comes to reading, and my kids will appreciate this because they're both big readers, but I have always been a hesitant reader, so I listen to audiobooks. It is called The Shrewd Samaritan, Faith, Economics, and the Road to Loving Our Global Neighbor by Bruce Weidick, and it is an amazing book. Um, it does it does have all of those elements of, of faith and Christian lessons in it. But the more important part of it for me, along with those just those lessons um, you know of the Good Samaritan, right? He does talk about how how you can be shrewd and smart with your giving. And that is so important. And that is something that I have found with Rotary. And so that's one thing that that is really just something that it's actually the second time I've listened to this book. So for example, if you want to give money to a place that does not have running water, for example, and you go in there and you you put a well in there but you don't, you don't leave boots on the ground for someone to learn how to you know, flush the well or maintain it. You go back in two years later and it's overgrown because it, there hasn't been buy-in from the natives that, that are intended to use that item, that well, whatever it is. So, so if, you haven't done, if you haven't done the research, if, you're, if you haven't done that, then your, your good intentioned giving can actually you know, can, can actually be less useful to the person that it's intended for. So that's, that's the premise of this book. And your, your global neighbor can, you know, your neighbor now can be anyone from literally the person beside of you to someone, you know, halfway around the world. We, we have the ability to, to give in so many different ways to anyone that you want to give to. So so you can find your passion and it doesn't always have to be money. It can also be time, especially if you're looking locally. There's so many, there's so many ways to give. That sounds like a fantastic book. I'll have to, I'll have to look that up myself. And finally, uh, you shared a recipe for cranberry orange sauce. That sounds amazing. Do you make that every year? I do. And again, my children and my fiance will attest to the fact that I am not really a cook. I, I do not profess to be one. Um, so making cranberry sauce is my go-to. And this recipe is fabulous. This is actually coming from the Greensboro Symphony Guild, their cookbook called Recipes of Notes, Recipes of Note, uh, a collection of recipes from the Greensboro Symphony Guild. This was one of their fundraisers several years ago. So this particular cranberry sauce recipe you put the cranberries in the oven and bake them with a ton of sugar. And then you also are roasting walnuts or pecans, either one will work. And then you combine those with also a ton of sugar in the form of orange marmalade. And then it just, and then you add um, lemon juice is the other thing to give that little bit of tang to it. And then you stir it up and put it in the refrigerator. It will keep for three weeks. It is a stress-free, holiday side. And sounds amazing. And and, it, and uh, you said you got that from the Symphony Guild. Are you a, a fan of going to the Symphony as well? Yes, I get season tickets every year for me and my fiance. And we go to the Pops concerts, which are wonderful. This year, they're actually doing uh, a Mick Jagger Pops concert here in Greensboro. So, but they always have um, things like, generally they'll have, you know, the Star Wars themes and the, um, 
John Denver, those kinds of things. So I usually go to those. I go to the classical uh, concerts a little bit, but generally it's the pops that I go to. So it's always fun to hear popular music played orchestrally. It just, it's, it's such an interesting and different sound, you know, another way to experience that. I think they should do Def Leppard too. That would be amazing. <laughs> I, I would go see that for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Excellent. Well, it was wonderful having you on the show. Again, Miss Alamani's book, Ava Antibody Explains Your Body and Vaccines is available from Barnes Noble and other major retailers, as well as her website, avaantibody.com or your local independent bookstore. Thanks again and have a great day. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Like the show? Have a question? Stop by the Facebook and Instagram pages. Links are in the show notes or search for Creative Piecemeal Podcast on social media and click follow for all the latest.